literally create bubbles. These bubbles expand rapidly, and they are the Big Bang in itself. So in some sense, you become a midwife to the creation of a new universe. So if it is possible to have the shortest distance, it's also possible to access what is called the Planck energy. And at the Planck energy, these tiny bubbles form, and these bubbles represent gateways to other universes. Mary in Denver sends a long email, but she says, thank you for your book, Physics of the Impossible, read it many different times, given a copy to everyone that she knows, loves your program on the Science Channel. She asked several questions, but I just want to pick out this one. Do physicists always need to get PhDs, and where are physicists most needed in your view? Physicists, I think, are most needed creating the inventions that will generate prosperity and wealth. Think of the 20th century. The 20th century was a century of physics. What did physicists invent? The answer is everything. Who invented the MRI machine? Who invented the PET scan that we use in hospitals? Who invented radio, television, microwaves? Who, create, who unleashed the force of antimatter? What about the laser? Uh, what about all the fantastic technologies we see in the 20th century? All of them were either invented by or were midwife, midwife by a physicist. So where are physicists most necessary? To create the technologies of the 21st century. That's why we have to make an investment in hard science. However, I don't see it happening. Congress is beginning to get stingier and stingier with money. Our educational system is not producing large numbers of physicists. Uh, the Chinese, of course, clearly understand the importance of physics. That's why they send their students to Europe and the United States, and now they want them back in order to energize the Chinese economy. So the danger here is that we may have lost the edge we had the edge during the time of Edison, during the time of Ford, making automobiles and making light bulbs and exploring new frontiers of technology. Have we lost that edge? Maybe. And I think that's, very, that's a very dangerous situation to be, especially with hungry countries like India and China coming up the ranks. They know the importance of hard science. They send their kids to America and Europe to learn all the hard science, and now they're beginning to woo them back. And so that could deplete our ranks if we cannot attract the finest students, if we cannot generate our own homegrown scientists here, here in the United States. But Dr. Kaku, throughout your books, you give examples from universities all across the country, Duke and MIT, um, and in Europe, Vienna, et cetera. Um, it sounds like we're still doing a pretty good job. We're still doing a pretty good job. However, it's not stable. It's not stable into the future. Because of the fact that other countries are rising, uh, they know very well the importance of hard science for, for their country. They take the finest minds and send them overseas. China, for example, has what is called the CUSPI exam. They take a billion people. Take the university kids, give them an exam. Take the brightest, the brightest of the crop. These are called Cuspia students, and they send them to Europe and the United States, where, where, where I meet them. Okay? So I understand that these are some of the brightest minds uh, that were culled out of a population of over a billion people. And a lot of them stay in America. They energize Silicon Valley, but now they're being wooed back to China, and it makes news in the New York Times when that happens. So it's something that we have to be careful of. We don't want to rest on our laurels. That's what I'm saying. Rhonda in the Florida Keys, please go ahead with your question for Dr. Kaku. Hi, Dr. Kaku. What a pleasure to finally say hello. How do you do? My husband and I have always practiced the art of manifestation. And that's the power of positive thinking. Actually, I have a small theory of reality equals intention over energy. And I followed your shows for many years instead of going on dates. I have to say that I don't understand if we know that in experiments, the observer observing affects the outcome. How come the rest of the world doesn't understand our message to you is, how come they cannot make change happen? How can we have terrorism and negative thoughts? What can we do to affect change that we need if we are indeed co-creators with God or the energy? All right, how we got the we idea, Rhonda. Well, Dr. Cocker. Well, you ask a lot of very interesting questions. First of all, you're right about positive thinking. As uh, former President Eisenhower once said, a pessimist never won a war. 
A pessimist never won a battle. Pessimists do not make history. History is made by the optimists who dare to challenge, to be able to unveil the secrets of Mother Nature. So first, we have to have the will, we have to have the curiosity, we have to have the, the preparation. And you mentioned intention and energy. Yes, you have to have the energy. You have to make the investment in order to make these things possible. And you have to have the intention. But so many times, we have people who don't like that. People who feel comfortable being 500 years into the past. People who like theology, uh, people who believe that the word of nature comes not from nature, the word of nature comes from a book. And I'd like to tell this story that I mentioned in my next book, Physics of the Future, coming out in March. If you were an alien coming to the Earth in the year 1500, the year is now 1500, and you're an alien from Mars landing on the Earth, what civilization do you think would eventually dominate the Earth? The Europeans? The Muslims or the Chinese? Who do you think would dominate? Well, the answer would be obvious. Anyone but the Europeans. The Europeans were mired in the Inquisition. They were torturing their finest scientists, burning their heretics. They were mired in the past. And then you had the great Chinese Empire, discoverers of gunpowder, the compass. You had the huge armies of the Muslim Empire. They were the ones who created algebra. Al, it's a word the in Arabic. The stars were named Algol, Altair, by the Arabs. They had optics. They had algebra, they had mathematics. So why did the Europeans eventually prosper? And the answer is very simple. The Chinese turned inward. They created one of the biggest fleets known to humanity in the 1400s and then burned the boats. They turned inward. Same thing with the Muslim Empire. They began to look for words of wisdom, not from nature, but from the book, the Koran. They turned inward. While Europe realized the power of science, technology, steam engines, the Industrial Revolution, electricity, and now we see the differences in the fortunes. So why am I speaking English today? Why am I not speaking Chinese? It's because of science. And we have to understand the power of science that Europe was the backwash of civilization in 1500. It was a net importer of technology, not exporter. Europe was a net importer of technology, mired in the Inquisition, but it was the beginning of the Renaissance, and that's why I'm speaking English to you today. Rather curious email here. I don't know if you can help us. What is being built at Michigan State University for the new physics? Um, that I'm not sure. However, at the great universities, Michigan University, Michigan State, uh, we have vibrant physics departments, uh, vibrant departments in electrical engineering, computer science, but specifically, I'm not sure what that refers to. Do you know what the Pegasus Proje Project Pegasus is, David from New Jersey? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of that. He says that the U.S. government achieved quantum access 40 years ago. Quantum access means the ability to teleport and time travel. Well, you probably mean the Philadelphia Experiment, right? First of all, there is a Hollywood movie called The Philadelphia Experiment where people are able to teleport a battleship and the military apparently had a secret project in the 1940s. If you go back to the actual history of where that movie got its origin from, you realize that it came from an article, an article where somebody said, well, maybe it was a secret project. In this rumor, it was the military trying to teleport objects but you realize that we physicists have looked into teleportation. We actually teleport atoms. We've looked into wormholes and stuff like that. These technologies are centuries into the future, and there's no way that the military of the 1940s could have performed what is called the Philadelphia Experiment, which is a Hollywood movie. Martin Jacobson, Ph.D. from West Texas A&M University. Dr. Kaku, in your popular work, you are often drawn into areas outside your training and background. How much time do you spend studying these secondary areas, and what is the most interesting thing you gain from doing so? Well, if you know physics, then you know the foundational frame by which you can begin to go into other areas, like artificial intelligence, like biotechnology. First of all, who created biotechnology? Back in the 1950s, biology was a rather slow-moving science where biologists were giving names, names of different creatures. That's called taxonomy. But physicists at that time dared to say that there was a molecule. 
a molecule that coded the secret of life. That physicist was Erwin Schrodinger. He was not only the founder of quantum mechanics, but he wrote a book called What is Life? And he said that life itself is nothing but physics. It's nothing but a molecule encoded on that molecule is a code of life. Francis Crick read that book. James Watson read that book. And they said, aha, they know what that molecule is. It's called DNA. So it's no accident that it was physicists and biologists that broke open the whole field of molecular biology, which created a whole new era in medicine. So again, if you know physics, you are a giant step ahead in terms of understanding other areas of science. Glenn, thanks for holding. Freeland, Michigan, you're on with Dr. Kaku. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, you just uh, mentioned Watson and Crick. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, um, I heard James Watson and a lot of other people say that uh, Darwin is the greatest scientist of all time and uh, evolution is... Um, the best idea anyone's ever came up with. Um, I was wondering if your guest agreed with that, and um, does he believe that human evolution is finished? And also, I'd like to ask him about, um, he was talking before about the idea that your um, dead relatives could be in the living room with you in another dimension or whatever. That sounded kind of like ghost to me. I was wondering if he, if he put um, any stock in the idea of any of this um, paranormal kind of stuff a lot. All right, got it. Okay, first, evolution. I think if you were to ask Darwin himself how to rank his role in the scheme of things, I, I think Darwin probably would have said that Newton is perhaps one of the greatest scientists of all time because he set into motion not just the equations of his mechanics, but a way of thinking that the universe is governed by material forces, not spirits and demons and, and ghosts, as you mentioned. And that's the Newtonian revolution. However, I would say that if I were to rank three, the top three scientists who have ever lived, who changed everything around us, I would say Newton, Einstein, and Darwin. They, I think, changed not only everything around us in terms of technology, medicine, bombs, uh, the internet, uh, laser beams, but also our way of thinking, our way of thinking about the universe itself. Now, when you talk about quantum mechanics, it does sound kind of spooky. In fact, Einstein himself said this is spooky action at a distance coming into physics via quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics does not have ghosts, so you don't have to uh, think that mysticism is coming back into science via quantum mechanics. However, quantum mechanics does have this bizarre property that electrons can dance in different kinds of modes, be two places at the same time, exist in parallel states, multiple states simultaneously, and hey, get used to it. That's just the way the world is constructed. We don't see it because we are large objects. We're large objects, these effects largely average out. But that doesn't mean that even though these effects average out, they're not there. As I said before, in your living room, there is the wave function of dinosaurs because maybe that comet or meteor missed the Earth 65 million years ago because of a quantum event, a solar storm that pushed that, that, that comet away, for example. In which case, there'd be dinosaurs in your living room right now and the wave function of dinosaurs would be right there, including the wave functions of your loved one. So we're not talking about ghosts. We're talking about measurable, quantifiable effects and quantum mechanics has been shown to be correct to one part in 10 billion, making it the most accurate physical theory ever proposed in the history of the human race. Next call, Dodge City. Hi. Uh, 